Well, today we jump back into our series through selected passages of Isaiah. I've entitled our message this morning, God's Exaltation and Reign of Peace. God's Exaltation and Reign of Peace. You know, the first time that I preached Isaiah chapter 2 was in 2009, and I made a mistake. I was preaching to a room of mostly professing believers. But I remember, first off, making the mistake of screaming the entire time. (laughs) Because verses 6 to 22 is attacking man's pride. And here I was yelling. There was no tone of humility. Telling people, humble yourselves. God is going to judge you. But the mistake that I made was one of speaking to a room of believers who have Christ. And even if you're not yet a believer, you have access to Christ. But I was speaking to them as if they were the rebellious people of Judah in Isaiah chapter 2. So today, we're going to treat this a little differently. In Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, talks about this future time. This is a time where God will be fully exalted for all the nations to see. And as a result of God's immediate presence among the nations, there's peace. There's no more war, no more violence. No more evil or the presence of evil is just the reign of God's peace. But then Isaiah chapter 2 verses 6 to 22 is just judgment upon judgment upon judgment. It it talks about a time where God is going to destroy human pride. Any nation, any individual that exalts human achievement, God's going to just destroy and shatter every single thing that we exalt. Because only he will be exalted. Now, when you look at a passage like this as a Christian, right, not as Isaiah's original audience, we will get to that. But as a Christian, I think here's the flow I want you to hear in your heart today. Heaven seems distant from us. You know, unless you're on your deathbed or unless you are battling disease, and you can see the end coming, heaven seems distant from us. But God's presence is near. And if you lose sight of that, you will seek heaven on earth. Let me say that again. As Christians, it's not that we don't believe in heaven. It's not that we don't long for the day where God's peace reigns. But because to most of us, heaven seems distant, but God's presence is near, if you don't focus on God's presence, you will be tempted to look for heaven on earth, even as a Christian, and you will be disappointed. Some of you will be drawn into temptation, but as a Christian, the Lord will always bring you back, and he brings you back through passages like Isaiah 2. You ready? Here we go. Isaiah chapter 2. You have God's word? Meet me there. Point number one this morning is the peace and exaltation of God. The peace and exaltation of God. Now verse 1 kind of sets it up for you, so you'll have to look at that in your scriptures. It says, the word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And all that goes to say is this is a prophetic word that Isaiah, he didn't just hear it, he saw. God gave him a vision of what would be in the latter days. Now, chapter 2, verse 2 is where we jump in. In verse 2, I want you to notice that it says, it shall come to pass in the latter days. That's a reference to the end times. In my understanding, this is a reference to the millennial kingdom. That the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of mountains. and shall be lifted up above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Latter days talks about a time where there would be a new Jerusalem. The mountain of the house of the Lord refers to Mount Zion. Zion is a hill, Jerusalem, the capital of the city of David, the capital of Israel. But this is located in the southern kingdom of Judah. It was located and built on a hill. Not only that, but in ancient Near Eastern times, typically religious establishments like temples, like the Old Testament temple, Solomon's temple, it was typically built on hills. Even in the non-Jewish world, they would build religious temples on hills. Why? 
so that the entire community could look and see the center of worship. Not only that, but there was a superstition, and you could totally understand this, that the higher you are in terms of your elevated status, so if you built a structure on top of the mountains, you would be closer to the heavens, right? Logically, that would make sense. And so it wasn't just Israel, but the nations would typically build their religious establishments on a mountain. But it it talks about the house of the Lord. And this is not Solomon's temple. This is the future house of the Lord that it shall be established. Not yet, but it shall be established. And it says on the highest of mountains, the poetic language that you can see mountains throughout the Old Testament having symbolism, Mount Sinai, where the Lord met Moses. Mountains. And so the temple would be built on the highest of mountains. And it shall be lifted up above all the hills, and all the nations shall flow to it. I want you to notice that it doesn't say just Israel. It doesn't say just Judah, but all the nations. This is a fulfillment of Genesis 12, verse 3. Not only the fulfillment of the promised seed, but the promised seed bringing blessing to all nations. That all the nations would come to Abraham's descendants. They would come to Jerusalem. Now you notice verse 3, it it picks it up, it continues. It says, and many peoples, with an S, right? And many peoples, plural, shall come and they shall say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. So not only are people coming, but they're inviting people. They're saying, hey, we're going. Let's all go together. Let's go to this mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And so you get this picture where Israel was supposed to be a light to the nations. God of Jacob, Jacob is one of the forefathers of Israel. Jacob's sons become the tribes of Israel. And so it's like Israel is the light to the nations. And all of the nations are coming to the Lord through Jacob, Abraham's descendant. And why? It says, so that he may teach us his ways. That means that the nations, right now the nations don't believe in God. Right now there are nations that believe in other gods or they're secular, but all of them are actually coming, wanting to know the ways of the Lord, and then saying, why? And that we may walk in his paths or his ways. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, the law of the Lord being proclaimed and taught, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And so the people come voluntarily. The people are inviting other people to come. And it's not just Israel, it's the nations. And what's going to happen? Because of the Lord's presence, in verse 4, he shall judge between the nations. And he shall decide disputes for many peoples. Now you stop there for a second. This is not just a judge sitting on, in a courtroom, on, on the bench, right? This is not just the Supreme Court, but this is the highest judge. This is God. His judgment is righteous. Not just righteous, but His judgment is loving. His judgment is good. And it says that He shall judge between the nations, that that's why there's peace. He shall decide disputes for many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares. I just want you to think about that. That the weapons of warfare. So you got to contextualize that into today's context. They had swords. We have nuclear weapons. We have weapons of mass destruction. We have missiles. Jet planes. It says that they shall beat their weapons, their swords, into plowshares. What do you do with plowshares? You're harvesting the fruit of the land. There's spears into pruning hooks. You're going to go fishing. You're going to, instead of making weapons for warfare, you will make tools for feeding. And then nations shall not lift up sword against nation. And check this out. Neither shall they learn war anymore. I just want to highlight that for you. Not only Are they not going to have war? But the defense industry, I know some of you work for great companies, and we still need you to work right now. But in this future time, there's no more Boeing defense or Raytheon defense. There's no more. You won't need to work at those companies. Nobody will research weapons and defense. right? You won't even learn more war anymore because there's no war. Now, I just want you to think about that as a Christian. How do you hear this? I guarantee you 
then most of you will walk here at 12.05, walk out of here at 12.05, and you won't even think twice about this. And that's why we're changing how we're approaching the proclamation of the Word of God. Because it seems so distant from you. I think as believers, most of you, if you're a believer, you're going to say, wow, I believe, Pastor, in every single word that you just read and that we just saw. I believe in it. I believe that God's going to come back one day because it says latter times. I believe that there's going to be a day. Oh, we long for that day where there's peace. We long for that that day where there's no more war. But here's where we are like Judah. Because heaven seems so distant from us, but yet the presence of God is near, but our hearts long for heaven, and in our minds we've convinced ourselves that that's so distant, but yet God is near, we tend to look for heaven on earth. We look for the beautiful things on earth to represent what our hearts really long for, only to be disappointed, but for Judah it became enslavement. You see, Judah, much like our first world country, was under King Uzziah. And last week, I mentioned that King Uzziah was a good king militarily and politically. Judah didn't have to worry. They're kind of like us, right? There is a country located on the Pacific Rim who threatens constantly to shoot missiles at us or, or claiming they could shoot something at Hawaii, right? So if you're... If you're the nation of Judah, you're like, okay, of course, the Assyrians can invade at any time, but we have defense. We have chariots. We got Abrams. There's something better now than that, right? We got the best technology, chariots. We got horses. We got strong military. And economically, Judah was good. Commercially, they had trade. Sound familiar? And so as a result, of course, they are a history of people of faith. They know what it's like to be invaded. They know what it's like to take on nations and not depend on God. And their forefathers lost at war. But yet when they turned to God, God fought for them. They know what it's like to have a God that would part a Red Sea or a Sea of Reeds for you so that you could go across. And then the strongest military at the world in that time, Egypt, just drowned all their chariots, all their technology. But, Judah, you have forgotten. Why? Because things are good. Beloved, can you see yourself now in the land of Judah as an American citizen? You know, sure, there's always going to be the threat of warfare. Sure, economically, we go through ups and downs. We go through recession. We have inflation. But guess what? During times of temporary and relative peace, and if you extend that for a time, God's people forget about God. They know there's nobody in Judah that's not going to believe in this. They know that heaven is going to come. But when heaven seems so distant, yet God's presence is near, and we forget to draw near to God, we will look for heaven on earth as the enemy, Satan, wants to present to you, heaven on earth. And we will exalt the things that we find security in. We will set our hearts and our lives to pursue and achieve the things that have given us this superficial temporary peace like economic power, military power, economic security, health care, etc. Those things are important in society. But if you forget about God, it's devastating, especially for people of faith who should know better. That's where you see that in Isaiah's audience, there's two types of people of Judah. There are those who are totally spiritually blind at the moment. Last week we saw that the spiritual leaders, or two weeks ago, that God's people were far from God because their leaders were far from God because one like David was not on the throne leading them and pointing them to Yahweh. But there was a second type of person there. And I pray this morning that you might be that second type of person. And that second type of person was what we would call the remnant. And so they're sitting there listening to Isaiah chapter 2 hearing about the beauty of the Lord, and they know that it's distant, but they know, man, this, the Syrians can invade in the very next chapter. 
The Assyrians can come anytime. They're looking around. They're saying, my Jewish kinsmen. Sound like Paul? There's a remnant there. That they're saying, my Jewish kinsmen, look at my neighbor. They're not doing it in judgment, right? But they're saying, my neighbor is just chasing after the things of this world. They're trusting themselves in military power, economic power, and horses. Don't they know that that's why Solomon fell? Has it been so long since the fall of Solomon and the folly of Solomon, the wisest person temporarily in the world? Have they not learned? When will the people turn back to God? If only one like David would draw near. The difference between us and the remnant is the son of David, Jesus Christ, has drawn near. And so as a Christian, how do you handle point number two? All right, as Christians. So the first thing we saw was this this future glorious time of the exaltation of God. And as a result of God being exalted among the nations, you see this time and this reign of peace on earth. But the second thing we see in verses 6 to 22, and we're just going to take selected passages, is the pride and the humiliation of man. The pride of man is not going to disappear because it lives within our hearts. We need to recognize that, right? That's why there's no world peace because of man's pride. Did you ever think of that? And then we look at world peace as an external solution, and we see the lack of peace as an external problem. Nations are fighting. People are fighting. But until we deal with the internal, which at the time of Judah, they did not have that solution yet. Until Jesus Christ comes and brings you peace with God, and until every single person in that future time has peace with God and Jesus exalted in their hearts, there's not going to be world peace. You see how it makes sense? That in that future day, the reason why there's world peace is because every single person at that point has peace with God internally. You need to deal with the internal. Otherwise, you're never going to have the external peace that we long for. Pride becomes the problem. And because of pride, there's going to be a future day. Again, it seems distant. It seems distant from us. So we don't see it coming. For God's people in the Old Testament, God would use different nations to humble them put them into exile, put them under the rule of other foreign kings. In other words, if you don't allow Yahweh to be your king, you want to turn to the ways of the world, then you will be subjected to foreign rulers and the ways of the world. That's how God taught his people. But it's different from us as Christians. But point number two, the pride and humiliation of man. O house of Jacob, verse 5, come, Let us walk, let us live in the light of the Lord. Believers, we can walk in the light of the Lord. But this is to Judah of the Old Testament, walking in the ways that would serve as a symbol of God's presence. What does it mean to walk in God's light? It's to walk in relationship to Him, to walk in His presence, to know that He's there because God is light. In Him there's no darkness. But our hearts have darkness, right? We have sin. We're surrounded with a world of sin. And so the only way to walk in God's light is to recognize his presence, is to pay attention to him and draw near. And in the Old Testament context, it's to pray to him. It's to confess sins. It's to go through the biblical teaching of going to the temple, offering the sacrifices, but not just going through the motions, as we saw in Isaiah chapter 1 two weeks ago, but truly worshiping from the heart. Then in verses 6 to 11... Isaiah states the problem. The cause of Judah's current condition of being far from God is that they've trusted in mankind. They've relied on themselves. They've focused on human technology and human endeavor, and they've no longer depended on God. Why? Because heaven seems so distant. God's presence is near, but if they don't focus on God's presence, then they begin to look for heaven on earth in the things of the world, and then they will be disappointed. Notice, Verse 6, it says, for you, for you have rejected your people, the house of Jacob, because they're full of things from the east. So that's saying God has rejected his people because they're full of things from the east. Full of what? Eastern culture. The things that they import in, foreign religion, foreign philosophies, and fortune tellers. So rather than praying to God, they look to fortune tellers like the Philistines. And they strike hands with the children of foreigners. When I think of strike hands, I don't know, forgive me, I think of UFC, you know. But strike hands is not talking about, you know, ultimate fighting. It's saying striking a deal. 
shaking hands, signing contracts. Rather than looking to God, you're making deals with the children of foreigners. And again, this is the Old Testament context. In the New Testament, we are to engage the nations, but here they're trusting in foreign nations, foreign technology, foreign rule, rather than turning to God. They found their security in the best that the world has to offer. And if God didn't give it to them within the commonwealth of Israel, they would look to the foreign nations. They wanted to be like the world. They, I mean, how could you lean into fortune tellers when you have the sovereign God who speaks to you through prophets and through the word of God? He's given you his law. He's given you himself in terms of his presence for you. How could you turn to fortune tellers? It's easy for us to say that, but we turn to different things to determine our future, like our bank account, like the stock market, like financial you know, analysis. All of that is good and wise and important to pay attention to. But if we bank on that, that's like, let's count our fortune. Let's kind of see where things are going to go and try to predict our lives and make plans based on the ways of the world. You notice verse 7. Verse 7 says, their land is filled with silver and gold. Well, so is ours. But our commodities are different than silver and gold. It says their land is filled with silver and gold. That's the best that finance has to offer. It does not mention Bitcoin or anything like that, but real money here. It says there's no end to their treasures. That seems like a consumeristic, you know, capitalistic world. And their land is filled with horses. Again, don't laugh at that, right? But horses were like the highest in terms of technology. It's like, look, man, I got a Ferrari. Oh, yeah, I got 16, 26 horsepower. What kind of horsepower? I got real Mustangs. I got real horses, right? Horsepower, right? And there's, and I meant to say earlier, and I said this earlier, but there's no end to their chariots. Again, this was technology of their time. Who has the strongest military? Who has the best vehicles and modes of transportation? Land filled with silver and gold. This is the best that the world has to offer. But when you have God, And when you have the host of angels that fight for you, when you have the Lord of hosts, why do you need the best that the world has to offer when you have the creator and sustainer of this world? You see, it's not not that Israel, like Judah did not fail because they had chariots or horses. It's that they began to place their faith and their security in their military power instead of trusting to God. They're trusting in their military to the point of not turning to God. And they... You will see in the coming weeks and even in this passage how they begin to turn to the military support and alliances with foreign nations. And compromising through an alliance meant you brought in foreign gods. You look at verse 8. It says their land is filled with idols. You see what happens is when you begin to trust in the best the world has to offer, you begin to idolize the ways of this world. It just takes a few generations and it says they bow down to the works of their hands. That's like, hey, look, look at our technology. D- don't get me wrong. Technology is good. God gave us creative ability because we're created to be creators in our own light, in the image of God. But when we begin to worship our technology, when we begin to worship the beauty that we create, then that's idolatry. And it says, it says to what their own fingers have made, but that perfectly describes the world that we live in. Now, what I'm going to read to you, I don't have on slide for you, but let me just read this into your hearing. Look what God's going to do. It says, so man is humbled and each one is brought low. Do not forgive them. That's speaking figuratively. Of course, God forgives through Christ. It says, enter into the rock and hide in the dust from before the terror of the Lord and from, and from the splendor of his majesty. There's going to be a day where God comes. Now, here's, here's verse 11. I put it on the slide for you. I want you to see this. It says, the haughty or the proud looks of man shall be brought low. And the lofty pride of men shall be humbled. You see the future tense? Remember what we saw in the first four verses? God shall be exalted. There shall be a day where the nations come to the house and the mountain of the Lord, but there also shall be a day where man shall be brought low and the lofty pride of men shall be humbled and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. You see, if we exalt anybody else, any other thing, any other entity, any other organization, anything, any asset higher than the Lord himself, there will be a day where God will humble 
humble man. And what it means to have Christ is Christ is Lord. What it means to have Christ is that there's this daily battle in the heart of the believer where we're constantly being challenged. You see, that's the difference. Do you understand what's happening? Is that with Judah, they were dealing with pride. They were enamored with the ways of the world. But they did not have the internal power source to deal with that that pride. Now, God still dealt with them. God still showed them externally. God still visited his people. He still dealt with them spiritually. And that's why there's a remnant of people. But the difference between a believer is that we go through the daily tension of here's what the world says, here's what God says. Here's what the world says, here's what God says. But you and I actually have the Lord in our hearts, and he is exalted. But sometimes there's a cloud that covers that throne. And there's a temptation that we're always trying to put something of the world competing with Christ, and Christ shows us through trials, through disease, through loss of loved ones, kind of reminds us of our finite nature, doesn't he? Through the economy changing and maybe us losing our work, just through relational strife and issues, he reminds us. It's just a gentle reminder for us as believers. He reminds us, hey, Christ alone, only Christ can be exalted. Everything else will fall one day. You might not see it now, but you begin to see the foretaste of the day when everything in our hearts will be shattered if it's not Christ. Christ alone will reign in our hearts because one day Christ alone will reign in this world. Now you see in verses 12 to 18, it just gets more devastating. Let me just read you one of those, uh, two of those verses, and then um, the rest of it I'll, I'll, I'll just read it into your hearing. But it says, For the Lord of hosts has a day. Against all that is proud and lofty, against all that's lifted up, anything that you lift up, it shall be brought low. Against all the cedars of Lebanon. And uh, God is not against cedars. God's not against his creation. But the cedars of Lebanon, this is the best material that you could purchase to build your beautiful buildings of that time. It was the cedars of Lebanon. God's saying the most beautiful material you could use to build your beautiful houses That's all going to fall lofty and lifted up. And against all the oaks of Bashan, against all the lofty mountains, against all the uplifted hills, against every high tower, against every fortified wall, against the ships of Tarshish, representing the best of world trade and financial exchange, against all beautiful craft and technology, all of that, God is against. He's going to bring it down. Then verse 17, verse 17 and 18, and the haughtiness of man shall be humbled, and the lofty pride of men shall be brought low, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day, and the idols shall utterly pass away. And he keeps going, right? He keeps going, but I I want you to, uh, before we go here, let me read this into your hearing. Verses 19 and 22. It says, and the people shall enter the caves of the rocks and the holes of the ground from before the terror of the Lord and from the splendor of his majesty when he rises to terrify the earth. In that day, mankind will cast away their idols of silver and their idols of gold, which they made for themselves to worship, to the moles and to the bats, and enter the caverns of the rocks and the clefts of the cliffs and before the terror of the Lord from the splendor of his majesty. So what, and when he rises to terrify the earth, so what seems beautiful to you and me as believers, that day that we long for the splendor of the Lord being revealed across the earth is going to be a terrifying day for anybody who does not have the Lord exalted in their hearts. And finally, verse 22, here's the exhortation, stop regarding man. Stop there. What does that mean? Stop looking to man. Stop looking to humanity. Stop chasing human achievement. Stop building your life around what the world has to offer. Stop chasing after worldly goals. Because there's a reminder that in whose nostrils is breath. That speaks of our finite nature. Look, we depend on oxygen. And God's the one that can determine whether or not we get oxygen each day and how much oxygen. For what account is he. This reminds us how finite we are. And again, I want to bring you back in to understand Isaiah's context, right? Until you are going through chemotherapy or until 
you realize that your life is finite. Just a reminder. So if you're like in your 80s and your body's beginning to remind you that, that the world is going to end at any moment for you, then your heart might be closer to heaven. But if you're running hard, then what are you doing? You're raising your families. You should be responsible. You're, you're saving money. You should. You're looking at your retirement. You should, right? You're planning your days. You're, you're thinking about what your goals are. For some of you, you're thinking what you're going to eat for lunch, right? You're thinking about what you're going to do tomorrow and the next day. I think that's human life. I don't think we need to apologize for living life because God has given us life. But anytime you forget that, hey, standing right next to you, Israel, is the Almighty God. Do you recognize that He's there? And for the believer, it's even more convicting. As you pursue life, do you realize who's living in your heart? And if you forget to draw near to God, if you forget to spend time in the presence of God, you, all these things that you pursue, they will become more beautiful to you than heaven that's so distant. Again, unless God reminds you somehow through sickness or through you know, impending invasion for Isaiah's audience to stop regarding man because in whose nostrils is breath, for what, what account is he? You can die at any time. You and I are finite. He reminds us through trials. He breaks us down so that we look back upon him. You see, for the believer, we don't need, we don't need to fear the future terror of the Lord. Let me say that loud and clear. I think that's the big mistake that I preached in 2009. I was yelling at a, at a room full of mostly teenagers and most of them professing believers, telling them that God's going to destroy them and their pride and he's going to come and crush them. And he's not going to do that to believers. But what we're missing out on is that if you spend any amount of time, it could be five years, 10 years. For some of us, it takes 30 years. For Israel, 40 years wandering in the wilderness. For some of you, you got to go through 40 years of chasing the world to realize what you're missing out on. And along the way, all of the consequences. You see, the problem is not that God won't forgive us as believers. The problem is not that God won't bless you, but you won't see his blessings. The problem is along the way, you're going to make a lot of mistakes that could be prevented if you drew near to God earlier. If, if someone just reminded you, look back to God, Isaiah chapter 2, and recognize that he must be exalted, it, it will impact your relationships, less broken relationships that need to be mended, less pain and hurt over time, right? And more joy in knowing that even though heaven is distant, because you remember that God is near, you pursue the beauty of God's kingdom in this world, and you begin to invest in God's people. Evangelism, disciple-making. And, and you realize that even though Christ is not yet sitting on that throne visibly on this earth, he's sitting on the throne of my heart. And because he's sitting on the throne of my heart, because I'm like that remnant that long for David, only I know that the son of David sits on my heart, Jesus Christ, that I can begin to live for him. And what Israel did not have, which is this constant peace with God, we as believer, believers can have. And where it was just an invitation for them to walk in God's light, we actually can walk in God's light. But we won't walk in God's light until we stop regarding man and we stop regarding ourselves. You see, what we need to deal with is to deal with that pride, but part of that pride is what the world is built around. The, the beauty of this world is built towards going after your pride, going after what you long for, self-sufficiency, as we read self-achievement, right? Sometimes we don't think of that. The reason why we exalt human achievement is we long to achieve ourselves. We wish that we could produce a beautiful world and, the, and pursue the things of the world apart from God. But we need Christ. Now, where is Christ in today's passage? He's there. You just got to turn to chapter 4, okay? So um, let's go there. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 1, all the way to chapter, chapter 4, verse 6, is actually one unit of thought. But if you just look at chapter 4, verses 2 to 3, the remnant had something to look forward to. It says, in that day. So there was a day of the Lord that would come, and there's a day of the Lord where Christ would be revealed, 
And there would be a day of the Lord where there would be no more war on this earth and God's presence and his reign would bring global peace. And there would be a day where he would judge all evil and level all human pride. But then in chapter 4, verse 2, it says, In that day the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious. And the fruit of the land, right, because there's no more weapons of warfare, you're turning it into harvest plow. The fruit of the land, the spiritual fruit, shall be the pride and honor of the survivors of Israel. Who are the survivors? The believers. And he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. Everyone who has been recorded for life in Jerusalem. In that day, the nations will come. So this is not just Jews who believe in Messiah, but these are you and me, believers, Gentiles, who believe in the Messiah. Now, how do we know that the branch of the Lord refers to Jesus Christ? You've got to go to Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah 11, 1, it says, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. Right? And clearly, Jesse being David's father, this is talking about the greater son of David, the branch that comes out from the Davidic line, the Lion of Judah, the Lamb of God. This is the greater son of David. This is talking about the Christ that is to come. You see, that's where you find yourselves in Isaiah chapter 2. You find yourself in Isaiah chapter 2. There are the remnant, the people who see what's going on in the world and their hearts long for the son of David. Only if one like David was sitting on the throne instead of Uzziah, the people's hearts would be directed to God. For you and me, one like David sits on the throne of our hearts. But sometimes we're thinking, if one like David, if Jesus would come back and establish his kingdom now, then we wouldn't have problems. If Jesus would come back now and just deal with everything, we're still looking at it externally. And Jesus said, I already came 2,000 years ago. And you guys want to talk about mountains. There's another mountain called Mount Calvary. And Jesus took his version of the day of the Lord there. All the terror, all the judgment, all the wrath was poured upon God, God's son, the son of God, on the cross, the greater son of David. And if you believe in Jesus Christ as the one who paid for your sins, who died for your sins and rose again, then he can live in your heart. He will be exalted in your heart. See, that's the Christian. The Christian is the remnant that longs for the day where Christ will be revealed, but finds joy in knowing that the presence of God already lives within you and me. The greater son of David lives in our hearts, but the question is, will you exalt him? Right? The application, the big idea is clear. The big idea from our passage is future-oriented because that's the tone of Isaiah chapter 2. It's very clear that Christ will be exalted, pride will be eliminated, and peace will be established among all nations. You read Isaiah chapter 2, it's so clear. Christ will be exalted, pride will be eliminated, and peace will be established among all nations. But applicationally, we saw in verse 5, and we saw in verse 22, our direct application. The first is that even though Zion is in the future, we must walk in the light of the Lord today. You have the light if you have Christ. You must walk in that light. Do not be blinded by the beauty of this world. See, through Christ our Lord, we can walk in his light. We have Christ. So stop chasing the world. That, that's the irony, right? Is that the people in Isaiah's passage, they don't have Christ revealed yet. You and I are Christians, most of us. We profess Christ. And if you're not yet a believer, Christ is available to you today, right now. So why is it that we as Christians continue to be enamored by worldly achievement and the beauty of this world? I think that's a question that we all have to answer for ourselves. I think if we can answer that in our devotional time, we will experience God's peace internally. Right? We have to ask ourselves, what, what is it that drives our pride and what is it that when we see human pride being achieved, we, we revel in it, we, we worship it, we exalt it human achievement. What is it? We long for the best that the world has to offer, but yet we have Christ. I think that's a question that we have to examine our hearts, because one day he will be exalted. 
But until then, the Holy Spirit's going to do his work to destroy and eliminate pride within the hearts of genuine believers. And sometimes the way that God does it is painful, but yet he shepherds us. He takes us through it. He shows us, look, you're battling pain in your body, but I will guide you through it. I just wanted to remind you that you're finite. I just wanted to remind you to walk in our light. I wish that the Bible translation, I'm not, I'm not a biblical author. I wish it wasn't walk in the light. I wish it was limp in the light. You know, when I was proud, see, this is the irony of it. This is the irony of it. I love wireless mics, right? 2009, how old was I? I'm not going to tell you, right? But I was running, running into the pulpit, you know, not too, too long as a graduate from seminary, yelling at a bunch of people, telling them to be humble, full of pride in my theology and in my exposition. I was not walking in the light. I was saved. I, I genuinely loved the people I was preaching to. I got the text right. But there was still pride, even as I was preaching against pride. Today, literally, I'm on Motrin right now, but literally, I'm limping into the pulpit. I'm literally, like, like someone would tell you, I hurt my foot trying to play basketball again, you know. Um, but it didn't hurt till Wednesday. I played on Monday. It didn't hurt until Wednesday. I woke up. I couldn't walk. And so I'm on Motrin. But literally, I wish it was limp into the light. Limp into the light. I wish it was limp into the light. Because when it says... O house of Jacob, you whose forefather, Jacob. How did God get Jacob? Someone tell me. Talk to me. How did God get Jacob to trust in him? He, he what? Wrestled with him and what? Put his hip out of his socket, right? Limping. O house of Jacob, have you not known... Do you remember your history that you are a people that needs to be broken? But when you are broken, you will not run ahead of God. You will not run too far behind God. You will walk. You will limp in the light of the Lord. And only when your hip is put out of socket. Yeah, that's, that's what happened to Christ. Only Christ is perfect and sinless. They crucified him, beat him. And so that through Christ, in Christ that we can limp as crucified people. O house of Jacob, until you learned what Jacob had to learn, then you will understand what it means, the invitation to come, let us limp, let us walk in the light of the Lord. That even when you try to do things for God, Israel, you're going to have pride. That's how the internal battle works. Only then will verse, 20, verse 22 come. You see, I think that's why Isaiah structured this way. First, verse 5, come, let us walk, because first, the Lord needs to come. Then, verse 22, you will stop regarding man in whose nostril is breath, for what account is he? You and I will not stop regarding ourselves. We will not cease striving from chasing after human achievement until God shows us how finite we are as humans and how we desperately need him. O house of Jacob, learn from your forefather that God had to break you so that Jacob, your human intelligence, he was so smart. He was cunning. He was slick. He knew how to trick people. Jacob, until all of your human achievement and all the things that I gave to you that were good, until I break you, then you will use it for my kingdom. Right? Sadly, that's the case. So Isaiah 2 reminds us, heaven might seem distant, but God is near. And until we realize that we need God's presence, and how does God help us realize Sometimes by humbling us. He's a good God. He doesn't judge us like verses 6 to 22. He doesn't destroy us. He doesn't have his own sheep running and hiding in the cleft of rocks. Instead, he gives us the things that we don't want. Discomfort, trial, challenge. So that we'll look to him. 
so that the things of this world won't seem so beautiful, so that we will exalt Christ in our hearts. And when we exalt Christ in our hearts, then we will have peace, even if the world continues to have warfare until he returns. We will have peace with God. Do you want peace with God this morning? Some of you here this morning, I say this lovingly, you think you have peace with God, but you're, you, I don't have to say anything mean. You know that your heart is not filled with God's peace. And maybe you've been in church all your life. If that's you, I want to invite you today to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I'd love to talk to you. You know me. You know my past. I'm not going to judge you. Don't be afraid. Come to the table. Gabe, Pastor Gabe, myself will be there. Maybe Pastor Terrence, maybe some other brothers and sisters. We'd love to talk to you and just loving you lead, lead you through a prayer to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. The next steps table is located in the foyer. You'll see me standing there. Just come by. We'd love to lead you to Christ. Let's talk about that. You know about Jesus. You've been in church all your life. Why don't you have peace with God? Some of you, for the very first time, you're hearing this, that you can have peace with God, even as the world is not filled with peace. But the one thing standing between you and the peace of God is your human pride. No, we're all proud. And the Christian life is a lifelong process of God destroying and shattering the pride in our hearts so that he won't literally break us like he says in verses 6 to 22. That's going to happen to the unbeliever. But what happens to the believer is that he begins to break and shatter and destroy that pride, exalting Christ in our hearts. He can do that for you starting today. If you've never received Christ, I also invite you to receive Christ for the very first time. If that's you, we're going to close now. I want you to pray, pray this prayer with me. Heads, uh, heads bowed, eyes closed. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. And if you've never received Christ, I want you to pray this. Father in heaven, please forgive me for my sin. I acknowledge that Jesus Christ, your son, is real. I believe that he died on the cross for my sins. I believe he rose on the third day, the first Easter Sunday, from the grave. I believe that he's Lord and I want him to be my Savior. I repent. Help me to turn towards you. Help me to stop exalting other things in my life. Help me to exalt Christ. May Christ be exalted in my heart. Destroy the pride in my heart so that I would have your peace. If that's what you prayed, you have Jesus today. Come to the next steps table after service, and we would love to help you take your next steps in following Jesus Christ. For the rest of us, let's pray this. Father, help us to be reminded through Isaiah 2 not to exalt ourselves. Even though heaven seems far away, you are near. Help us to draw our hearts to you. And when we forget, remind us. Thank you for gently reminding us through trials and not destruction and judgment. And Father, help us then not to find heaven on this earth through human achievement. Instead, help us to exalt you, looking to the day when you will return to establish your kingdom. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.